Good day. My name is John Jeffries Daniels. I was born on the 8th of March 1952. At the time, my father was in the British Army fighting the Mau Mau. After that, he, um, he joined the Kenya Constabulary. So I moved. I was born in Nanyuki Hospital, which is right on the equator, halfway up Mount Kenya. So I was born on the equator. We then moved from Nanyuki to Rueru. That's where he joined the constabulary. 1959, Jomo Kenyatta became Prime Minister of Kenya. And Dad was fighting Jomo Kenyatta and his Mau Mau rebels. And Dad said, I'm not staying in the same country. So my family, we decided we'd go to England. So we spent five years in England, which was really cold. <laughs> But I had a good child, I had a great child. It was just myself and my sister. She was born in England, I was born in Africa. Um, we had a great childhood, good parents. My mother actually wrote to Menzies saying, right, we're a family, we'd like to emigrate to Australia. My husband has his qualifications. The next minute we're off to Australia. So 1965 we arrived in Australia. <laughs> um, my sister got a job at uh, Stratford Sawmills. Dad got a job as a public servant with the police. We then moved out to a place called Redlinch, north of Cairns, which was a really old Queenslander, and we would do morning teas and lunch for tourists, because north of Redlinch was the Crystal Cascades. So we'd have our big coaches had come in, they'd have their morning tea of scones and jam. Then there was a 12-seater Bedford bus. But I'm driving up to the Crystal Cascades and all the tourists, who are. Then I used to stand on the rocks and they would throw money and I would dive down and pick the money up. Ooh, yeah. And then I'd drive them back and they'd have lunch. So that was good. We did that for a number of years. Well, I used to get in the rowing motor every day and go to school. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I had a really good life as a child. You know, yep, I got my ass tanned when I did wrong. But, yeah, other than that, I had a really good childhood. And then when we came out here, it was just great. Um, I turned 17, so I was in the army cadets at school, so I had that army through me all the time. Um, turned 17, I wanted to join the army, but Vietnam was on at the time, and Dad wouldn't let me join. So I joined the, what was commonly now the CMF. It's now Army Reserve, but it was the CMF. So I was in 51 up in Cairns. And then I'm hearing about all this national service, so I went to the chief clerk and I said, Chiefy, you know, tell me about national, yeah, 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 ballot balls and all this. And I said, can I volunteer? Oh, come here, young man. <laughs> so I signed. Next minute, I'm down here in Townsville to a unit called 4RAR, but they were over in Vietnam. So it was virtually a re-details element. So went off to Kapuka, did my training at Kapuka, came back to Townsville, 4RAR. Battalion came home, Gough Whitland would pull the plug on Nashos. And they said, right, oh, you can go back to Cairns now, you've done your obligatory two years. And I said, well, can I join? <laughs> so, 48 years later, <laughs> I got out. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I don't know what would have happened if I'd have gone to Vietnam. That's in the past, but yeah, you know, I wanted to go. But yeah, battalion came back and I'm going, right, when are we going, man? You know, da 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 da. <laughs> Nothing happened, so yeah, I, um, I stayed in 4 RAR, we linked in 73, so I joined 2 4 RAR. Did my time there, then I got posted out. They kicked me out after 10 years. <laughs> and I got posted to the School of Infantry. Had a great time down in Singleton, loved it. Got posted back here. So I've done, as you see on there, I've done various units in and out. But I've been a towns away, I've only had two power stings in 40 years, which is rare. A lot of people get two years and you're gone, but every time I was due to get posted, see, I'd say, no, I want to promote him. So I went from private to staff sergeant in 10 years. <laughs> so that was good. So yeah, um, just had a, had a ball in every post I went to. Back then it was nothing. So it was either go to high range, exercise, go down south, Shoalwater Bay, exercise, if you were lucky, you got a trip to England, or in my case, I got to New Guinea. So, 
being a second fourth battalion, we walked from Itapi down to Weewak and traced the second fourth battalion fighting the Japanese. So that, that was a good experience. Um, going from private to staff sergeant, I was sitting there as a section commander one day and I'm sitting on my pack and a company quartermaster would just give us a, a big hot feed because we've been on ration packs for so long, a couple of beers. And I'm sitting back having a smoke on my pack going, I could be a sergeant, I'm still sitting on my pack. I could be a war officer, I'm still sitting on my pack. Um, I want his job. <laughs> so when we got back, I applied to go to the Q store and they said, all right, but you're going to have to drop a rank because we've got Lance Corporal's due for promotions. I said, fine. So I went back to being a Lance Corporal. And then I just went from Lance Corporal, Corporal, Sergeant, Staff Sergeant, Woe 2, Woe 1 through my logistic system. So I was either an RQ or a quartermaster in the various units. Um, you know, back then it was, it was your mates. You, you, you relied on your mates, they relied on you. You didn't steal. If you were down to your last smoke, you give your smoke to your mate. Yeah, that, you, you had that bond of mateship. And uh, you had the, the soldiers that weren't so good, well, you wheedled them out and got rid of them. <laughs> so you had a good cohesion in the unit. Yeah. And it wasn't until I got two tours of Butterworth, 76, 78, um, that was good. Back then it was bad, bad country, so we were chasing communist terrorists up to the border. Had uh, red magazines with live rounds on. And I think the biggest fright we got, we're going through the jungle, looking for these terrorists. Next minute the forward scouts go to see an enemy. Um, and it was a tiger. And this tiger just came from left to right, flicking his tail, just walking and he sort of, no, I've already eaten. I don't think I'll eat you guys and kept walking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So whilst I'm Malaysia, we're on patrol chasing communist terrorists because there was still a, a communist terrorist threat throughout Malaya, then Malaysia. So we were there, and I think it was till about 1986 that they actually stopped sending. We went, still went to Butterworth, but we didn't go out and chase the CTs pushed by them. The British Army had sorted them all out, and Chang Pei had. Uh, surrendered, so yeah, they, they, they stopped that. They still send guys to Butterworth now, but it's a three month tour, and there's no bad stuff happening over there. So the guys do their training, they go to a place called Pallada, which is a huge jungle training area, ranges, so you do all your qualifications at the in Malaysia. And then we come home. Um, then nothing really happened until 1992, and Big stuff was happening, bad stuff was happening in uh, Somalia. So the Defence Force decided they were going to send a contingent of soldiers over to Somalia to help. Because what was happening, the, the non-government organisations were sending food trucks to all the villages and they were getting ambushed by the, by the what we called skinnies. So they were the bad guys. So they wanted a protection force. So one RAR was the online battalion at the time, so we massed out at 960 soldiers. Um, some left Christmas Eve in 1992 on the Jarvis Bay and the Tobruk, and the rest of us flew Boeing 747s to um, Mogadishu. So we landed in Mogadishu. So there's all these soldiers. All we had was a little Qantas flight bag. I happen to have a 9mm Browning and ammunition in mine. <laughs> but all our weapons were in bubble wrap, sitting in this 747. So there's this huge big wall and there's guys up on the top of the wall with 50 cows. There was the biggest fight going over the other side of the wall and we're going, get our weapons, get our weapons. So that petered out. Then we got onto trucks and we were assigned a uh, humanitarian area called by Doa. So it was a big airfield that the Yanks had had we came in, took over from the Yanks. There was no wire, no barbed wire, no nothing. So we had to get our pioneers, build barbed wire all the way around the camp. Big airfield, with supplies were coming in, bringing in the NGO supplies. And then every nine days, the rifle companies would rotate Dinsour, Barakabar, Alibalatin to feed the villages. 
to give them food because they were starving. You know, it was just thousands of people starving. I think the biggest thing for me was when it rained, so they would wrap the corpses up in sheets and bury them. But the ground was that hard, so when it rained, all these corpses started to pop up <laughs> out of the ground. And then it was, oh my God. So that, that was one bad thing. Um, once we had established the AO, got rid of the militia, there were still people going to the water point and demanding money because they'd have guns under their coats and they were demanding money. So we had to send guys to the water point so these villagers could get water without being charged for it. And yeah, uh, I wasn't involved in any contacts. Well, shut up, I was. The rifle platoons were involved in a lot of contacts, especially in, in Baidoa itself. I went out on the very first coordinate search since Vietnam. So we had two APCs blocking the road, soldiers, and we had to stop every vehicle and search it. Now imagine a 14-seater single-story bus and 28 people got off. <laughs> and I wrote in my notebook, you know what was happening, including 28 civilians and one goat. <laughs> but they had plastic bags full of shillings, thousands and thousands of shillings. You know, they were taken between Baidoa and Mogadishu, so yeah, we had to confiscate all that. Had no incidents, uh, a couple of tried to run, the boys run them down. Myself, we had to go to the camel market because had a corporal, an intelligence corporal, and he wanted to talk to these people about where these guys were out. Uh, and I'm sitting there in my Land Rover, my storm ones beside me, and next minute, this, like a, like a Toyota Ute, parked right in front of me. And I'm saying, mate, you know, shift your car, and he popped up the bonnet, and then disappeared. Now, at this stage, the camel market was just full of people. Behind us came an old Italian Fiat truck with a load of blokes on it. And I'm going, hang about. I've got a car stop me here, and I've got this truck stop me there. And the next minute, and luckily, they were kids. <laughs> So you've got the low roof, next minute these two kids come up, firing AKs. Now on AK-47 they fire it and shoot straight up on fully automatic. So we got a few rounds in the Land Rover and we engaged them, sorry to say, we killed the kids. So I'm going back at this guy, you know, get you, and he wouldn't move, so first we <laughs> pulled, pulled his shit out of the road and kept going. So that was the first contact. About three weeks later, I went out as a protection party for uh, Raimi guys, because one of the vehicles for recon had broken down. And this place was like all dead trees, very quiet, very quiet. So the guys are doing the mechanical thing, and Mossy's over here, and I'm over there, and I'm going, no, oh, there's something, there's, it's quiet, but there's crackling of timber. So I'd warn Mossy, keep on that side. So I went round and that two skinnies come out. Black, black, black. Got them. Anything your side, Mossy? No, 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 right -o. Just be aware. So yeah, these guys were gonna try and take over the vehicle. So that, that, was, the, that was the second contact for me. The rest of the time was quiet. <laughs> Funny incident was this kid came up to us with a silver cylinder on the bridge. And he's gone, bomba, bomba. What the fuck are you talking about, you know? So, okay, we're looking at it, we're playing with it. Uh, we'll just put it down, call the OB to come out and get it. So we're standing there. Engineer guys comes out and he says, oh shit. He said, that's an Italian grenade. You didn't touch it, did you? And I looked at the boss and he looked at me and said, no, 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 no. <laughs> he said, oh, they're very, don't ever pick them up because you tilt them, they'll, they'll, they'll just go off in your hand. Steve and I looked at each other. <laughs> yeah, right, eh? you take it away. <laughs> We didn't touch it. The next time was we're um, going through the streets trying to clean up all the all the room wrecked cars. So we had um, engineer dump trucks, and all the Africans were on board as usual, singing, doing all their stuff, and they would go and then we'd throw all this shit on it. So there's this burnt out Datsun that the forklifts trying to pick up, and next minute all these skinners going, my car, my car, you pay, you pay. 
it's burnt. Oh no no no, my car. So Steve got into it. He was he was the captain. So Steve got into it and saying no 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 no. And next minute it was all this crowd around Steve. <laughs> okay, cock cock. <coughs> Steve, step back. <laughs> Let the guys do their job. Next one on the radio. Contact, contact. No, 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 it wasn't contact. We just crowd dispersal. Oh, you did kill anybody? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> but so funny, this bloody grenade. Um, captured a lot of weapons. We had a big ISO container. We must have had 3,000 weapons from every era of, like we had a Star Mantula 1898 rifle that got presented later to the side. Officers mess, but from there, Sten gun, Schmeisers, AK, thousands of AK. So, yeah, we were, we were going through and clearing the villages of their weapons, but they were pissed off because they needed the weapons to protect themselves from the bandits. So, yeah, you know, it was, it was a, a big, big operation for the guys because every nine days they would just rotate and they were totally stuffed. Um, it was a peacekeeping operation, but uh, Senator Faulkner got up in Parliament and said, hang about, these guys are getting shot at. Um, they need some recognition, so we ended up with a double ASM, or Australian Army Medal, for our service. So instead of being a peacekeeping, we got nothing, because we weren't under UN, so we got the double ASM, which was good for the soldiers. Um, we came back home, we had a big parade down the Strand. Then next day we were on the battalion parade ground, all the units by their companies, and we were all presented our medal and our infantry combat badge. So that was, that was good for the boys, you know. But hey, I've got something, you know, a bit of recognition. The worst thing was, even though we were recognised for a, a double ASM and an infantry combat badge, they would not give us a campaign medal to say, right, this is a separate medal, class Somali. We never got one. Never got one, we've applied, still don't have one. So a lot of the soldiers that did their time got out they wear one medal or two medals, which is their ADM medal, the defence medal. And they're pissed off because 99, we then went to Timor and we got a campaign medal for Timor. But Somalia didn't get a campaign medal. We've applied. We actually had the CEO and the RSM of the battalion at the medals tribunal and they told them to leave because it was a conflict of interest. So we had an Air Chief Marshal and a Vice Admiral say, no, you're not getting a medal. So, <laughs> Somalia vets are really pissed off. Yeah, you know, more recognition, because you look at a guy's rack of medals now, and he's got Iraq, Afghanistan, class. Somalia vets are lucky to have two medals, unless they've then gone to Iraq or Afghanistan afterwards in their career. But yeah, it, uh, it's a really sore point with Somalia vets. So that, that was that, 92, 93, we came home, big parade. I went there 86 kilos, I came home 72 kilos. Even though our cooks were very good because we were on American rations. And American rations were just a big tray. And they stick it in hot water, take it out, lift off the lid and serve it up. Well, our cooks would then make. <laughs> They'd even go to the camel market and get camel steaks. <laughs> We'd have camel steaks. Um, the buildings were all shot to shit. We had the American CBs come through and put roofs on for us. So yeah, 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 we were comfortable in what we did. We were protected, except when <laughs> young Private Mackey was a cook and we had what was called a kitchen field mountable. So this was a, a trailer that you could cook either with wood, gas, it would boil, it would cook. And there was a 45 kg cylinder so young Mackie's picking up this tray of food, swung around, and back them days there was no star pickets chains, knocked the cylinder. It broke the regulator off and the gas went straight into the firebox of the trailer. <laughs> so next minute the trailer's on fire. There was a wall, like a, like a better wall with um, screen bricks. So that fire went straight through there, burnt all the guys, webbing, equipment, cameras, weapons. And the cookhouse exploded, so there's cans of bean and corn going off. <laughs> so yeah, that was a great, great fire of Boy Noah. And everybody's standing too because they could hear all these bangs and think something was happening. So anyway, 
we had that, and then about a week later, we got told to stand to man the carrot because General Lloyd Deed was coming through with 4,000 troops to attack us. Is this going to take much longer? But it never happened. So everything else was quiet. The guys were doing their things, having a great time. Uh, as I said, we come home, had the parade, and then nothing really happened operational-wise. I left one hour and I was posted to headquarters three brigade as a regimental quartermaster. And I was actually a duty officer. And there was a phone call for some, I can't think of his name now, Major General. And he said, uh, get your commander here. Now, I want to speak to him. So I had to ring the boss up who lived at Jazine. I said, sir, you know, this Major General wants to talk to you. So he come out. So I was privy to what was going to happen in Timor. Right, you want to get your brigade, elements, blah, 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 you're off to Timor. So I was privy then of listening in. I was also getting emails <laughs> of what was happening. So yeah, it was a good insight. Um, Johnny Howard sort of wanted to go back in March. You know, he said, this is, this is wrong. Indonesians cannot do this. We need to send a force. And of course, the general said to Johnny, well, hey, you know, you go over there, that's war. You are going to incite a war with Indonesia. You can't do it. He said, oh, OK, then. So it wasn't until September that they actually started to deploy the headquarters and all the troops. <laughs> Four o'clock in the morning, I'm there issuing weapons to the headquarters staff, brigade commander's crew. And this little major come running up and he says, uh, I'd like a pistol, please. And, Who the fuck are you, sir? He said, I'm the pay rep. I said, we're not even on the deck yet and you're going over as a pay rep. Sir, piss off. <laughs> Mark Evans is brigadier. Well done, Mark. <laughs> so anyway, we got the troops. Um, I sent one of my guys over instead of me because he hadn't had operational service. So I sent him, see, but about a week later, I got a phone call from my boss, who was, <coughs> excuse me, already in team, was saying, pay a copy, you know, three and a half pages later. So I got a, a Unimog truck and a Land Rover 6B, loaded up with all the stores that he wanted, formed up on two RARs parade ground, and I was in charge of a packet driving from Townsville all the way to Darwin to get on the Jarvis Bay. So we did that, got on the Jarvis Bay, and uh, the buffer, who was like the senior warrant officer on the ship, big bearded guy, and he looked at me, he said, God, Lord, JD. <laughs> yeah. What's that buffer? He was one of my diggers in 2-4. <laughs> anyway, we're there, and he said, I've got a good movie for you, JD. He said, all right. So JB hadn't been converted, so it was like a passenger ship full of seats. So we're all sitting in the seats, and he played Zulu. <laughs> and then he... Come over the intercom, men, we have uh, reached the 12 mile limit. The bar's open. <laughs> so up went the shutters, $2 a packet of smokes, a beer. <laughs> we had a good time. We arrived in uh, Dilly. The place was just stinky, burning, poor people sitting everywhere. And there was a ship, and it was an Indonesian warship and they were driving on Toyota Land Cruisers from the Toyota dealer, carrying computers, televisions, and nobody was doing anything. So me being me, got off the ship, and there was an armoured personnel carrier with a guy, and I said, mate, turn your turret around and aim it directly at that guy on the gun. I said, he even knows a sneeze. I said, you brass him up. Because this guy's sitting on a 40 mil bofa, you know, gonna, gonna blow the ship up or what? So anyway. We ceased that. Drove then from Dili to Baidoa, ah, oh, shut up, to Suai, and we took over the, what we call the CPO and the APO, so the, we took over the airport and we took over the sea. So all stores coming in, one of my crew would meet the landing craft, a plane come in, one of my crew then would be there to la unload stuff. Biggest laugh was one day Cosgrove came down and there was an Italian 
aeroplane. And Cos is going, oh yeah, now you see that? He said, we are going to buy that to replace the caribou. Oh yeah, it's a good short takeoff landing like the caribou. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> These Italian pilots came around, still with their props going, dropped the ramp and pushed off the aluminium L pellets that were on rollers. So all our stores were on L pellets. Pushed these L pellets out, Oh, backwash of the props, boxes fell, and there was packets of coffee, tea, sugar. <laughs> it was just like a snowstorm. Cos has turned into one of his minions. He said, get the number of that plane. <laughs> I don't know what he did to him, but yeah, it's just, just a funny incident, you know. <laughs> and we're all running around trying to pick all this stuff up before the next plane come in. Um, on my way, to Suai, I had my truck and my Land Rover on a landing craft. And I had my explosive signs, because I was carrying ammo. And the, the old captain of the, the landing craft said, oh, what do you got on there? I said, oh, they got 66s, claymores, you know. Oh, can we fire some 66s off the back? I said, you what? He said, yeah, we want to practice firing a six. I said, no, I said, that's for the troops. <laughs> oh, you were no good. <laughs> so. I strung my hammock up between my two vehicles so it'd stop anybody knocking the stuff off. Anyway, we landed, met up with the company, uh, based in Soy. Yep, buildings were all buggered. But the funny thing that got me was when they started to release the population back from West Timor, you could see where there was a building, hadn't been burnt, nothing touched. Next door was a burnt building or a, a, a hut that they'd had and it was burnt. But they wouldn't move into that building because the T and I had been there. So they went back out bush, cut more stuff, built their own little stuff. Sundays, during the week they're all braggy ass dressed. Sunday they were in their Sunday best and off they go to church. You know, just, they put up so much suffering. You could see, we fly over in a helicopter. <laughs> That's another story. We'd fly over in a helicopter and you could see that like 10 o'clock, bang, and the troops just decimated every village. So all you saw was burnt buildings. That's it. And you talk to any veteran, you know, Vietnam forward, it's the funny things that happened. Like my dad would never say what happened during the war. He would say the funny things like when they were in echelon, he used to wake the troops up every morning with a brain gun. Well, this damn thing would only fire one round. So we said, bugger this, we took it apart, cleaned it. Next morning, up stand two, press the trigger, and this thing, Burrrt. all the troops are out of their fucking fighters. <laughs> Throwing the shit out of them, you know. And when he was a POW, um, the commandant would say, Daniels, yes, commandant, Vob is mein Holzleg. Mein Holzleg? Because he had a false leg. They used to pinch it. Or they go to the German guards and say, Heinz, what is loose? Nix is loose. Nix is loose. Yeah, need some strong elastic. <laughs> Just silly things he would tell me. It wasn't after till I'd experienced combat that we could talk then because he could talk one on one. His bad times, my bad times. <laughs> yeah. These poor people, and the worst thing that got me was three Sisby with the, like the logistics people for the brigade and they had to move into this big warehouse, big long warehouse, nothing in it. But that's where they were gonna put all their stores. But what they sort of went, what the hell's happened here? All along one wall were spurts of blood. So what had happened, the TNI had grabbed these people, wired their hands behind their back, shoved their heads against the wall and slit their throats. So the bodies were gone, but the blood. And I go, Glad you guys are going there because fuck, I'm going to go and live in here. But yeah, so that's how bad these people were. The Timorese were building a new cathedral. It's a beautiful architecture, but you could see where they attacked. And running up the steps, you could just visualize these people, the nuns and the priests, running up the stairs to get higher, and these guys are just mowing them down, so there's just blood. And then outside, the people had made a memorial with hibiscus. 
and the T and I had grabbed these people and burnt their bodies. So there was just burnt skeletons and that was a memorial. So yeah, you know, no action taken, but they, that's what they did, you know, just. And they got away with it. They really got away with it. Um, yeah. And it wasn't until after that we settled in, stabilised the place, fed them, and <laughs> Mark Evans was a brigadier, and he said, JD, he said, do you used to play soccer? I said, yes, sir, I used to play for the battalion. He said, good. He said, I want you to make a teamery soccer team. <laughs> You ever tried running on a soccer field with kids that could play soccer better than you with a shoulder holster and a 9mm pistol <laughs> running around? <laughs> so we built him a set of goal posts with cam nets. And I had a captain who was an interpreter so he could talk to the... But yeah, they were brilliant soccer players. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I, I was in charge of the team of soccer. <laughs> just, just funny things. Another one, um, the commander's adjutant type of thing. He was flying in a helicopter over the, where were we? The airfield. And there was big thick brush all over that side and the airfield was here. So this helicopter's flying over, nothing. We got back to camp, next morning I get a phone call. Get as many soldiers as you can, get down to the airfield. Why? Um, Lieutenant Moore Wilson's lost his pistol. So he's sitting in the helicopter and his holster had come off his belt. So there's a holster and an IML Browning. So we got extended line, we're gonna go through, we've got about 10 meters inside and there's this kid walking out with his pistol off. <laughs> okay, so young Moore Wilson <laughs> was really red faced, but we found it. <laughs> oh, yeah, some funny things. But yeah, so we did good. Um, population thrived. Elections, yep, they were free. They still tried not to release the East Timorese and West Timor, but yep, we did that. Charlie Company had a contact on the border because they were using 1942 maps. And next minute they got uh, fired upon. So being Aussies, they engaged and killed two Timorese policemen because their maps and our maps were different. So anyway, that, that was all sorted out politically. Um, give the troops a chance to shoot. I was with uh, Headquarters 3 Brigade, came back, yep, I was a staff sergeant in Timor. No, I wasn't, I was a fucking arc you. So, next minute, um, they posted me to 42 RQR in Rockhampton, which is an Army Reserve Depot. So yeah, um, I did my three years there, unaccompanied, had a ball, had my own set of flats, there was all three army guys living there, right next to the railway station. So I had a unit at the time, had 50 land cruisers, troop carriers. And you get the section of soldiers and away you'd go. So we did an exercise, we drove from Rockhampton to Townsville and went to Weeper for kangaroo, one of the kangaroo exercises. So yeah, we had a ball there, came back, drove all the troop carriers back. Um, then we had to get rid of them. So we had to, you know, normal thing, maintenance, drive them all the way down to Brisbane for the auctions. Said, why don't we keep them? No, by then the numbers in the Army Reserve were a bit low, so we got rid of those. And then I used to have to go around to all the cadet units and check them out, see if they were all right. So yep, they were good. So I spent three years in Rocky, nothing much happened there. Major exercise was a kangaroo exercise. Then got posted back to Townsville and I went to Headquarters 3 Brigade. That's when I went to Timor. Came back, what was that, 2000, 99, 2000. Got promoted to WO1, 2001, 2002. I was the RQMS of 1RAR. And they were going to Timor because they didn't do the initial interfit. So they went off to Timor. I manned the, I manned the fort as a QM and every other Kiwi in between. I get phone calls, look, in the truck, in the, in the thing, we need more webbing, we need more of this, so I'd be packing it all up, sending it away. They came back then, uh, 2003, where did I go, 2003? 2004, 2005, shit, where was I? 
three brigade, one. Posted a 31 Arcua, another reserve unit. Did a lot of stuff there. Uh, then we had to move Jazine to Laverick. So I was responsible for all the units in Jazine packing up, identifying all their gear, taking it out to Laverack and setting up all the new units. So that was that was a monstrous big effort. We got in there. And then two oh shit, what was that? 2005. Eight. 2008. That's right, 2008 we then became 3142, so the amalgamate of the two reserve battalions. Then I had to set up a whole new logistic structure, transferring the stores, getting rid of useless stores, stuff like that. Um, left there, where was that, 2008, 2009, shit I can't remember where I went then. No, memory loss. Left your zine, went to Laverack. Oh, went back to one area. Did a couple of years in one. And then nothing. Um, I turned 60. And I had to get out of the regular army. So, I thought, right, I'm infantry. I'll go to combat training centre and go to Tully and train the troops in jungle warfare. Then I get a phone call from the adjutant at 1RAR saying the CO wants to see you. And I was going to rock up. Andrew Hockin was the CO, John Stonebridge was the RSM. And he says, right, take it here, you're getting out. Yes, sir. Uh, what are you going to do? I said, yep, going to combat training team, go to Tully, train soldiers. He said, uh, how would you like a job? I said, what? He said, I want you to be the curator of the 1RAR museum. I'll give you three days a week and 150 days Army Reserve a year. I'll take it. So for five years, I then um, became a Reserve Warrant Officer looking after the one hour Army Reserve, which I had a ball. <laughs> the only trouble was, because of my logistic background, they would say, JD, you're going bush, and I would then be looking after the Italian's ammo <laughs> out in the field. One of the funnies, we're at Shoalwater Bay, and normal, around your perimeter you dig your little pits. So every evening and every morning we do what's called stand two. So I'm sitting there in my pit, I've got my helmet on, my night vision goggles, my webbing, my weapon, I'm sitting there like that looking. I could dig as either side of me and they go, Sir, sir, yeah, what, what's the matter? Sir, you've got to lie in your pit. Why? Well, we're standing two. I said, mate, if I lie in that pit, it's going to take four years to pull me out. <laughs> Old infantry soldier broken. So anyway, yeah. That, that, was, that was one of the funnies. <laughs> oh, but yeah, they, and then, um, so then we were out bush doing another exercise looking after Ramo and the CEO says, um, oh, I've got a special mission for you, JD. I said, okay, he said, yeah, report to the CP. In uh, 20 minutes, so 10 minutes later, I've got my pack, everything. Where, where am I going? What do you need? I need rations. I need food, because we've been living out of ten mans. He said, okay, give us a recipe. They then sent me to Camp Macalane, <coughs> where recon and snipers had all gathered, and they told they were going to be picked up and do another mission. So we're all sitting in there. And then next minute, this uh, major and a warrant officer turned up and said, right, men, you've all been captured. <laughs> what? Yes, you've been captured. Move outside with all your weapons and your kit. So... Them being non infantry, I had to go through and all the weapons and clear them all. But I got in this truck, this is about two o'clock in the morning. And what it was, they grabbed these guys to do interrogation. So they would grab them, sandbag over the head, kneel, stress position, and they would play the most horrible music like, I'm a happy, happy camper, and, and that's all you would hear going through your ears, you know. An interrogation, interrogation. So then I had to report that they weren't being physically abused, anything like that. So yeah, that was that was a good experience. I've even got my notebook with all my notes. 
on that x-ray, I don't think, but yeah, and I got back. And the CEO said, oh, yeah, did a good job, boss. I said, yeah, and thanks very much. <laughs> oh, but the funniest song, it was like two o'clock in the morning, they said, right, I'll just go over there and set your hoochie up. So I set my father up, pitch black. I woke up in the morning and I'm looking at two guys in a gun pit about 20 metres away. <laughs> Oh fuck, so, g'day men, how are you? Yeah, good sir. I said, can I have some hot water so I can make a brew and a shave? Oh yeah, sure sir. <laughs> yeah, so that was an experience. Um, yeah, it was it was good to see interrogation techniques to what we used to do in the old days when they were sandbagged and beaten. <laughs> Stress behind the arms with a bloody pole and you'd cross your legs around a tree and you couldn't move, you know. So yeah, it was an experience from that interrogation to that one. So yeah, I wasn't happy with the boss. So I did that. 65 then, it was time I could do no more reserve. Boss said, oh, well, you know, would you like to come on as a volunteer? So I went to the museum as no uniform, as, as a volunteer and still the creator. So yeah, had a ball, had a ball, built the museum up. So we displayed from Japan right the way through to Afghanistan. Mannequins, weapons little pieces of, 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 of history. You know, it was really, really good. And then they sacked me. <laughs> um, we had this association called the Royal Australia Regiment, and we had all this money, but we'd folded. So we had a committee meeting and said, right, we've got this money, we are gonna give $3,000 to each of the battalion museums, and the rest will give to Legacy, fine. So we had $3,000 in the kit. Because we didn't have a bank account as a museum, they put it in the Reggie Trust Fund. So I'd go and see this 2IC major, I won't mention his name, but every time I'd say, look, you know, part of that 3,000, I need to buy some new perspex or I need this. Oh, no, 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 we'll get that. What he had done, he'd taken that money and put it in the Reggie Trust Fund and spent it within the unit. Now, it wasn't his money, it was the museum's money. So anyway. I upset him a lot, and then um, my ID card passed ran out, so it pulled in the paperwork, sent it away to be approved. And then he come down and saw me, he said, oh look JD, he said, um, COVID's on at this time, so we're not going to have any vets coming through the museum, um, I'm not going to review your pass, if you need anything, you ring Sergeant White and he will come and sign you in. Oh, what the fuck's going on here? About a week later, Tony gives me a ring and he says, oh, two or see wants to see us. I said, okay, well, you better sign me. He said, no, 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 we're going to fail for Waters Coffee Shop. So we're there and then he laid it on me. He said, oh, look, he said, why have you got two Vietnam displays? I said, well, first tour of the battalion, second tour of the battalion, that's our history. Oh, no, combine them. I said, no, well, I don't really want to do that. I said, it's our history. First tour was the very first Australian troops in Vietnam, second tour was the Battle of Coral. No, 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 combine them. Um, why have you got two Afghans? Well, one was MRTF-2 and the other one was FPEs where the rifle companies went over there. No, 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 no combine them. I said, oh, no, no, I don't like it, never mind. He said, why have you got all the weapons? I said, well, weapon for Vietnam, AK, weapon for Somalia, AK, weapon for Afghanistan, AK, different marks, different models. Oh, no, 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 you only need one weapon. Why have you got all these three as well? Japan, Korea, oh no, 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 no. Why have you got these SLRs? Well, Malaya, yeah. no, no, no. You only need one of each weapon. Yeah, I said, right, hey, this is writing on the wall. I came here, big lofty, you saw him before, big guy with a beard. We were here and I was talking. He said, well, come work for me. And lofty is the curator of Free Combat Sig Regiment's museum. He's on his own. He said, come work for me. So I rocked into the regiment, met the two IC and the CO. Next minute I've got a pass to get into Laverack. I've got Keytel to get the keys. I've been there two and a half years and having a ball. I love the battalion, love one hour out, but I will never ever go back and if they say, oh look JD, can you come back to the museum? <laughs> Sorry, don't want to play. So at this stage, after 48 years, I still do three days a week. Love what I'm doing, build things, Mannequins, authentic gear. Lofty said before he's got a mate, he's got two Vietnam era handsets for our radios. So, yeah, that's another bonus. 
were always after gear. We actually had a guy come in, he'd been on Operation COVID Assist down south, and he had all this little bits of stuff of where he was doing people, COVID. So he gave us his order, said, right, not a worry. Opened up a cabinet, you give me the story, put that in as well, you know. Okay, so it's a face mask, it's this, it's that, but it's history of the battalion that, of the regiment that this guy actually went over and did something, you know. So we're forever building and doing things. Um, the battalion 2IC, very good hand. He's been pinching lots of money off everybody, so we're getting a new museum built. So where our unit training facility is here, big patch of ground in a car park, that's going to be our new museum. So it'll be brilliant then we can, because at the moment we're using half a lecture room. So we've sort of gone around the wall, Vietnam, all the way back to Afghanistan. And that's all we can display until we get this new building. So yeah, just hurry up and wait. And I'll, I'll you know, I'll do another five, ten years there. Well, I'm capable. I just get to, get out of the missus here for three days a week. Um, as I said, I've been around a long time. It was so funny. I was at Kapuka because I've become a Nasher, but I still had to do Kapuka. So I went off to Kapuka, <laughs> and the sergeant walk along the ranks checking you out and he's looking at my name tag. Recruit Daniels. Yes, Sergeant. What's your first name? John, sir. John. Jack. Jack Daniels. So from that day I have been JD. Every man in his dog knows me as JD. I have had brigadiers, colonels, major generals call me JD. It's incredible. Everybody knows JD. You talk, oh, JD, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, as I said, I don't know what happens if I go before Helen and what they plan. Um, it's like my 60th birthday. We'd booked a mess and uh, friends, relatives, everybody was there. <laughs> and uh, all these people then got up and said, oh yeah, JD, yup, 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 JD, yup, 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 JD, yup, yup, yup. Oh, I've missed. I have missed. Army cadets. So I was at 3142 and back then they wanted you, they didn't want any infantry storming. You had to join infantry um, ordnance corps or you had to go to another corps. I said, look, I've got two years left to serve. I am not changing my hat badge for an ordnance corps hat badge. So this career advisor is going, oh, well, um, um, how would you like a posting to Singleton? I said, oh, Singleton, infantry centre, yeah, I'll go to the infantry. Oh, no, 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 you'll become the corporate governance manager. I said, no, don't want to. Um, um, what about headquarters army vets in Canberra? I said, no, I've got two years left. You're going to uplift me, send me down there for two years and bring me all back again. Waste of money. What else you got? Um, 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 nothing. I said, okay. And then about a week later, he rings me and says, oh, look, there's a warrant officer, Corny, was supposed to go as the opswo of Army Cadets, but he's pulled the pin. And I know Brett, he was one of my corporals, so we went to New Guinea and looking after gold mines and making a squillion dollars. <laughs> so they said, well, do you want this Army Cadet job? And I said, yeah, as opswo. He said, yeah, well, I said, ops, logistics, it's all the same shit. So I get then posted here, headquarters Army Cadets. Had a ball. Had an absolute ball. Me being me, I like to change things. So every year they would get all these stores from Townsville and drive them all the way up to higher range to Camp McElhaney and stick 400 kids in there. And I said, this is, this is a crock of shit. Why are we doing this? Oh, well, we've always done it. Well, they get here as school units, then we break them down into tiers one, two, and three. So the tier ones are the young ones, they stay in Laverick. Tier two and three, they, they disappear. Why do we need to go to Camp McElhaney? You've got Mount Stewart. There's ranges, there's heaps of areas. Oh yeah, we'll try that, so we did. Over after that, we went to Mount Stewart. The kids could shoot, live rounds, not do the wets like they used to make them do. I'd make them have fucking live rounds. I'd get infantry corporals, teach them on the weapon, and they had a piece of green ticket. And they were competent then. So instead before, the cadets would lie on the range, they would give them a rifle with a magazine, cock the weapon, the kids would go, Brrrt. 
nothing. Whereas I had the corporals teach them, then we'd go to the, the wet's range, so you had all the targets, 25, 75, 300 metres. Kids be there, they'd load, action, shoot. Then they would get a piece of paper from the range control officer. And they'd go, hey, look at, look at, look at that, I got headshots. Oh, yeah. They thought it was great. So, you know, I did, I did a few changes, upset a few people, and I didn't really care. <laughs> I saved money. It was like we had Helga. Helga. Helga was the resource manager in Canberra. And she was always saying, oh, you know, you've got to spend money, spend money. I had a $50,000 account. So I went down to $200. I could not spend any more. So I put on my paperwork in, set it down to Canberra. Helga rings me and says, oh, I've just put $5,000 in your bank. Um, you've got a week to spend it. Okay. <laughs> so the h &R guy and I, we went out and spent five grand. And we bought the cadet unit solar showers, porta potties, you know, you name it, we bought it. Got rid of your five grand within a week, there you go. You know, why, after all the time we'd spent looking after our money and then give me five grand? And, oh, anyway, that was another story. But yeah, I, I enjoyed the cadets. I, um, I'd go and visit the units, <laughs> go down to Rockhampton to 40, the cadet unit down in Rocky. There's a Q and an I down there. And no, Mark and I were there. <coughs> and they're showing us stuff. And where's the stores? Yeah, yeah. And there's these boxes, old wooden boxes with metal banding. And it said, pouch ammunition, pattern 37, 1942. So it was the old khaki type webbing, never been opened. Khaki. What's that big green box here? Oh, that's our ration. What do you mean, rations? Opened up the box. Ration packs. Date, 1987. Why have you still got the, oh, well, we need them when we do our bush trips. No, 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 no. I want to see you now. Throw all that in a wimmer bin. You'll kill somebody. <laughs> no, sorry, I don't care how you've hoarded it. Get rid of it. So, yeah, they wanted to tar and feather me. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I, I enjoyed the cadets. Uh, there were some good, really good kids and good instructors, good, good cadet officers and, and sergeants, yeah. And... Uh, Heatley, 130 ACU, used to invite me out to their parade. And none of the staff would be there, all the kids did. So you had the cadet RSM, the companies, all doing their own drill. Just brilliant, just brilliant that they could do it without anybody else saying, oh no, you can't do that, you can't do that, you know. They had some ex-regular army guys that had gone transferred to being cadet officers. So, of course, they were, they were, they were mentored by them, but yeah, they, those cadets. And then I would get, um, no, that was when, another period of my life I was on the committee of the RSL. First I was the cadet liaison officer, then I was a member really officer, and then I was back to cadets. So as a cadet liaison officer, I had to organise or go and see Navy, Army and Air Force cadets. So yeah, we'd get invited to the Navy parade, and they'd have their flag station, and then Air Force, and Brilliant prey to wrath. Perfect drill, absolutely brilliant, but yeah. So, I was involved cadets with the RSL as well as cadets as a posting. And that's why they made me cadet liaison officer because I was looking after the cadets anyway. So yeah. So um, yeah, I would say, unless you can get yourself a job at university or a trade, you need a trade. There's no good working at Mackets. You need a trade. So when you've done your time, you can work for somebody or you can expand and become a contractor yourself, but you need a trade. Also, I was thinking, look at the military. You go to the military and you want to become a dentist. Right, you will join the army, you will do all your testing at Kapuka, then you will become a second lieutenant, then you will do all your dental training, and guess what? It don't cost you a cent. You could become a lieutenant or a captain, making squillions of dollars, and it won't cost you a cent. You go to bloody uni, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to become a dentist. Do it through the army. When you've done your time, get out. You know, that's what I tell them. You know, 
We did a statistical thing when I was with cadets. 50% of army cadets, whether they're Navy, Army or Air Force, joined the Defence Force. 50%. So, same as me, I was in the cadets, couldn't wait to get in the army. These kids can't wait to get in the army. And they don't have to be army. I've had army cadets join the Navy. But that's what they want. But yeah, keep telling them. Cost you nothing. And it's a great job. You've got great mates, great... I was getting $18,000 a year as a private. You know, privates now are on nearly $50,000 a year. You know, money for jam. So yeah, you know, I, I, I push people to join the Defence Force. It's the same. I get a lot of diggers now, come and see me because they're getting out. What are you doing? I said, well, right. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Join the Army Reserve. They have flexibility, so you don't have to do Tuesday nights, but if you can do a weekend, great. And you can continue on with your civvy job. But join the Army Reserve. One is money in your hand, for a start. And you can do your civvy job, and you can do your Army job. And because of your military experience, they will embrace you and say, come here, young man because you can teach other people. So I, I tell them that, oh, you're getting out? Yeah, mate, right, uh, you had operational service. Yeah, I've done two tours of Afghanistan and Iraq. Okay, have you been to DVA and got all your paperwork in? What for? I said, mate, you're a vet. You've done operational service. You're entitled to a gold card. And then after 12 months, you get a TPI gold card. It pays for all your medical bills. It pays for all your... Uh, uh, medications. You're silly if you don't. Oh yeah, I've been thinking about it. Look, go and see this guy down at Quinn's Post. Come here, see Peter Mark. Get your paperwork in. You know, why not? It was the same when I was in the army. I always thought you couldn't put any claims in until you got out. Right, you know, broken infantry, knees, ankles, back, hips, shoulders. There was a boy here called Squizzy Taylor. And he said, come and see me. So I sat down there with Squids, right? 20 questions, you know, do you drink? Oh, moderate carton a night. <laughs> and they said, right, a, a government doctor's gonna come and interview you. So there used to be a doctor's surgery bit called the doctor's down in Flinders Street. So I went down there and I'm expecting some doddering 60 year old. <laughs> so I got this nice young 35 year old doctor is that all right, you veteran? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. And I'm continually doing this, because I squeeze you. Yeah, yeah. What's the matter? Oh, my hips are killing me. He said, okay. Hop on the bench. It's said, oh, do you mind if I just slide? Right. Let's have a look at your range of movement. Click, 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 click. Click. Click, click, click. You're fucked. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, um, I got my gold card, and with 18 months, I got my TPI. Yeah, you know, it helps. And that's what I try to get to these young fellas. It's not now. Five years down the track, next minute your back goes on you. You need a hip or knee replacement. If you don't have your gold card, it's gonna cost you lots of money. You gotta go and have a x-ray, costs you lots of money. I was amazed, I had to go and get an x-ray on my chest. And I'm there at the x-ray place, and there's this poor old lady in front of me. She had an x-ray for her hip, $600. I just showed me gold card, <laughs> signed the paperwork and walk out. I thought, this poor woman, $600 for an X-ray. No pension discount, no seniors discount, no nothing. When I was in one, I used to get the diggers come down and say, oh, sir, um, OCs asked me to do a, do a presentation on one hour in Malaya. Is that right? Come with me. Open the thing up, give them a thumb drive. Psh, download everything I had on Malaya. There you go, come on. You then, make up your story from that. Oh, thanks, sir. Yeah, they were forever. Or I'd get a platoon come through, want to have a look at the museum and the history of the battalion. I created a test. So I'd get the new marchings come through. So they needed to know the history of the battalion. So I'd give them half an hour, walk around, look at everything, pair them up and say, right, there's your test. You know, when was the battalion ground of freedom in the cities? When was the Battle of Coral? Who's the CO? All those types of things. And they'd write it on their piece of paper and said, right, what do you got? Yep, good. Oh, I couldn't find freedom of entry, it's on that frame over there. Oh, okay. Then I would give them 
the questionnaire with the questions and then the answers in bold underneath. So they had a history of the battalion from 1945 right the way through to Afghanistan. So that given, you know, who was the CO, who was the RSM, because they've just marched in. Who was the brigade commander, who was the, who was the chief of the army? Now, things like that. So, retention. Yeah, so yeah, you know, I love talking soldiers. And I think that's why I like going over there, whether they're, okay, they're all SIGs, but these guys have got more medals than I have because SIGs are deployed to every operation, either on their own or with a battalion group. So yeah, they, they see more bush operational time than infantry soldier would. So yeah, I, I, you know, I love it. I love talking to the diggers. We had one guy and he's, um, he's getting out and uh, he wanted to be a locksmith. Yeah, what do you want to do that for, Sean? He said, oh, you know, it's just something. I said, okay, Will, from Rushwinds is coming out tomorrow. Oh, you and Will sit down, because Will was one of my Armour Reserve soldiers when I was at Jazine. So next minute, Sean and Will are talking. Next minute, Sean is now doing his apprenticeship with Rushwinds. How good's that? And then he comes out and sees us. Yeah, he has a broom. Yeah, just so good. I was married, 77, to the ex-wife. Uh, what I didn't know at the time was Somalia, East Timor, and a company school of infantry, she was screwing around, you know, so fuck this. So I went to the lawyers and said, right, because she's going, I want half the house, I want half your DFRDB. Went to the lawyers, they said, right. Went to the bank, they said, give me a loan. I got $50,000, my lawyer to her lawyer, Cop that young area, that's all you're getting. And she took it. So I kept my house. I kept my day off. I paid her out and that was it. Never have to see her again. And then I was free to rain and outrooting myself stupid, <laughs> as usual. Um, and then I met this woman on the, on the net, at the web you do. She was administrator out at Malungra, which is a million and a half acre cattle property. So she's a bush girl, you know, she's done Bronco riding, bareback riding, bloody cattle drives and all this, so she's a bushy. So we met, yep, she moved down in 2003, uh, and when we started doing the markets, she said, I want a bigger kitchen. <laughs> okay, we'll go look it. So a mate of mine, where we are now, he lived across the road, and he said, oh, there's a house up for sale here, nice house. Okay, so there's this beautiful big house, big double carport, Four rooms, big shed. I said, I like the shed. Helen says, I like the kitchen. So we got there. Um, sold the house. I had my daughter and my granddaughter were living in a unit in Palmerston Street. They then moved, so I sold that. And then those two, I paid off my house. And yeah, so we do the markets every Sunday. So she cooks biscuits, jams, relishes, sugar-coated peanuts, Turkish delight, you name it, she cooks it. I sell DVDs and books. So I get the, I get the vets and I have books or people come down and donate books, so yeah, so that's it. And uh, we have a good time and then once a month, we go to the Strand on a Friday, set up there and yeah, good night, really good night. And that money we make then buys stock, ready for the next one. So yeah, you know, she's happy, I'm happy. <laughs> Gotta keep her happy. <laughs> Only thing I don't like is she, she does all the cooking or I'm in the sink. <laughs> What we used to call Dixie passion is cleaning all the pots and pans. Yeah, it's it's good. It's great. It's really good, and I enjoy my time at the museum. Um, I'm not one of these people who's sitting on my ass, going, "Oh, woe me! I'm going to be doing something." Like years ago, I used to have six weeks leave over Christmas. Six weeks leave. After the second week, I'm itching. I want to go back to work. I've got a beard, long hair, you know, the normal thing, and I'm going, "Ah." Oh, yeah. Now, I can't be sitting still, I've got to do something. So, and now I've got this U-Butte shed, so I've got my Triton and everything else, and yeah, build, build stuff. <laughs> Have a ball. I've said it in my will. Um, one, I donate my organs, whatever's left of them, that they can use, good and well. Second is I want to be cremated. So whether it's a cardboard box or a pine box, I want to be cremated. Then Helen is to take my ashes in a jar, 
get on the Maggie Island ferry and go to Maggie Island and spread me ashes so I can tra travel the world. <laughs> that's, that's me. I don't want... Yeah, I've done so many... Oh, you know, poor John. You go and see him every 12 months and leave flowers. I don't want all that. I just, you know... I don't want to be remembered as a stone figurehead. Remember me as I was and what I did. Don't want anything else. Don't want anything else. As I said to Helen, the next time I move, it'll be the hearse taking me out of this house. Go on, bloody, flame me up. But yeah, I, I, I don't want to be remembered. Um, I don't know what would happen um, at my funeral, no doubt. Many and varied people would be there and tell stories and lies. <laughs> no, have a ball. So that's 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 me. Forty-eight years. <laughs> <laughs>